Greetings and salutations, one and all. Welcome to today's episode of Risk and Reels. I am your host, Jeffrey Wheatman, and I am joined today by my friend Turner, who is very cute and handsome, but doesn't really know anything about cybersecurity. And more importantly, and more beneficially, I am joined by my colleague, Furhat. I'm sorry, Furhat, I know we've known each other for almost a year. How do you pronounce your last name properly? Well, the proper pronunciation of my last name is usually never mind in English because it is so difficult to pronounce that. But in Turkish, we say Dikbuyuk. Dikbuyuk. Okay. So you are so you are the, I don't know if you're a Star Trek fan, but so you are the Mr. Spock of Black Kite, right? Where Spock has a name and apparently no one can pronounce it properly. All right. Awesome. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, Farhad is our, our head of research at, at Black Kite. Um, he has been here for five or so years, which is almost as long as the company has been uh, in existence. Um, one of the reasons actually why I came to Black Kite was because of the amazing research that Farhad and his team uh, have done and, and continue to do. Uh, we'll get a little bit more uh, background uh, from Farhat, but uh, I'm really excited about today's episode because we are going to be talking about the update of our third-party uh, risk report, which we've done uh, a number of times, and there's some really, really cool stuff in there, uh, but I will let Farhat uh, explain that to you. So before we before we jump in, uh, Farhat, I think it might be cool for you to share a little bit about your background. Where'd you come from? I mean, I, I know your background is super cool to me, uh, but I think the audience would be interested to hear uh, sort of how you got in the seat you're in now. Thank you. First of all, you know, thank you for hosting me, Jeff. It's really an honor uh, to be on the program with you. Um, and as you know, I'm the head of research at Black Kite right now, but I uh, work on risk in general uh, for more than 15 years and cyber risk especially for, for more than five years now. And during my PhD at UC Davis, I worked on disaster risk disaster risk on telecom networks, but the disaster including the cyber attacks as well, because sometimes cyber attacks become a disaster as well, right? Uh, so uh, after the PhD, I was an assistant professor uh, in, in computer engineering before joining the Black Kite. But then I realized that there are more things to do on the practical side as well. So I joined the Black Kite. So I have both a scientific and practical mindset on cybersecurity. And the research team that I manage uh, in, uh, in Black Kite consists of uh, cybersecurity researchers and data scientists. They are all together closely monitoring the data breach, ransomware attacks, and cyber incidents on a daily basis. So that provides us a great insight on uh, how to reflect these trends in our research articles on our knowledge and parameters that we use on, on Black Kite pl platform. So, so you have a PhD, so we actually should be calling you doctor. Well, yeah, you can, but I wouldn't prefer. It's, it, it creates too much confusion about MDs. So. I should not come into the office and tell everyone that they should call you that. Okay, uh, awesome. So um, as we always do on, on the program, we start off talking a little bit about movies. And I, I'm going to ask you a question that I think will be unique among all of our guests. So um, Farhat is from Turkey originally. Um, so what is your favorite Turkish movie, or, or rather, what Turkish movie would you love to see be remade in the U.S., in, in Hollywood, and why? Okay, so it's kind of a random question. <laughs> um, well, you know, if I think about that, it would be definitely Eşkia, which can be translated as The Bandit. So it's a very classic movie in Turkey. Everybody loves that. It's about a, a famous 60-year-old um, bandit trying to adapt a new world after uh, being in prison for decades. So it is it is quite amazing because uh, it shows how you can adapt a new world with all um, the corruptions and all the other things that you see, how you would react to that uh, after becoming in prison for uh, so many years. So it's a great movie and I would like to see that uh, to be remade in, in Hollywood. How, um, how old is the movie? When was it made approximately? It is probably 1995 or 96, somewhere around that. Okay. All right. And you said he, he was a bandit. So was he like a bank robber, a car thief, broke into people's homes? 
So it's like uh, uh, in the rural areas, there are bandits in the mountains. So he uh, just cuts the way of the, the passengers getting the money from the rich ones and giving to the poor ones kind of. Like, it's like a classical Robin Hood story uh, in the past. But when he released, he realized that the crime world uh, become very corrupted and there is no honor at all. So uh, he fights with them. So the, the the phrase we use in the States, which you may be familiar with, there is no honor among thieves. Yeah. <laughs> There's no honor among thieves. All right. right. Awesome. So do you know um, whether it's been uh, either dubbed or, or subtitled? Because it sounds interesting. I love those kinds of stories. I'd love to check that movie out. Yeah, probably it is subtitled because that was a, so much success that the, in Europe, several countries also uh, played that movie. So uh, there's a subtitled version, I believe, not about the dub version, though. Okay. All right. You know, the problem is when my wife and I watch movies, she works. So subtitles are always a little bit tough because she's looking at her computer and then she looks up and doesn't remember what happened. So maybe that'll be one I'll, I'll check out with my, with my daughter. So I have to be honest with you, when we were prepping... Um, I did a little bit of research, uh, and I had no idea how um, prolific the Turkish movie industry is. There, I found a list the top two hundred Turkish movies of of all time. So that that's actually pretty uh, pretty impressive. Uh, that that um, that industry is there, and I I love. Personally, I love watching sort of the different cultural take, and I'll, I'll definitely check some of those out. So, all right, awesome. Um, so, um, not that I don't enjoy talking to, to Farhat on a regular basis, but part of the reason why we're, we had Farhat as a guest is because uh, Black Kite just released our new third-party risk report. Uh, we've been doing it for a little while, and I'll let Farhat give you a little bit of, of background, but... Um, when was the last release and why was the determination made that this was a good time to do an update? So we release this report every year. I think this is the fourth, fourth time that we do that. And every year we learn a different thing. We learn new trends, what is changing. And, you know, this report, like the previous ones, uh, is the result of a collective effort of black cat researchers and focuses on what has changed in 2022 for better or worse compared to 2021. So it, the, the, the data breach caused by third parties is an important um, factor that you know all the cybersecurity professions are really interested in. But every year we see some sort of change uh, in the, the threat actors' behaviors or uh, the industries, especially during the pandemic, we see uh, lots of change uh, until now. And now we see new trends and everything. So we will keep doing these type of reports uh, every year on an annual basis to understand these trend changes. Okay. How, how much work goes into it? So how long does it take from the time you say, all right, we're starting the new report until it actually gets published? Yeah. Well, we, as I said, we uh, monitor all these things on a daily basis. So we collected databases caused by third parties from cybersecurity news outlets to dark web to telegram channels and other black kite sources created multiple times by experts for correctness and consistency and when we look into these you know these are um, disclosed by the companies but the attack might have been um, happened uh, maybe four months ago three months ago so on a daily basis we keep you know uh, following these stories on from different sources to make sure that we, we got them in time. So it sounds like there's a lot of data that, that gets pumped into this report, which probably is helpful that you have a team of data scientists. One of the things that, um, or maybe confirmed, but we've seen a lot of countries put regulations in requiring declarations about breaches. Has that increased the, the amount of data that you're able to gather and analyze? Well, yes, of course, because now by the regulations, they have to disclose the information, the data, because before the regulations, it was more like a secret. They are, they are trying to um, sweep under the rug. So we have, uh, I wouldn't say more data, but more clear, clearer data, I would say. Okay. 
Great. Yeah. Cause you know, my, my dad, who's in his eighties at this point now, he actually kind of follows what, what we do in cyber. I don't think he understands a lot of it, but he's always asking me about, you know, new stories he hears, which is actually, I give him a lot of, a lot of credit. Um, but one of the interesting stories that's going on now is the SEC in the United States is actually going after a law firm whose clients purportedly were part of a bunch of breaches and the SEC wants to know. So I guess they can validate, well, they said this and this is actually the reality. So uh, my guess is you will continue to get more and better data uh, as we go forward. So, all right. So here's, here's the big question, right? What's new? In this report, what did you see that you hadn't seen before or maybe got some new clarity on? Well, yeah, this year, um, what we see is that threat actors, especially mm -hmm. ransomware groups, targeted less number of third parties to reach more victims compared to previous year. So it was kind of a surprising for me because apparently this less is more strategy has worked for them considering the, the, the victims, the number of victims in this year. Uh, so the the adversaries like they select the, the most impact impactful vendors in the ecosystem to increase the attack surface. The most impactful vendors create a, a, what we call a concentration risk in a larger vendor ecosystem. And I I I think and the data also you know provides the same insight that IT and software vendors are top of the list of these threat actors because with the COVID with the pandemic most people most organizations they start to use these uh these it vendors more and more and there are some vendors who touch so many organizations that are very juicy for the threat actors so among other risk indicators concentration risk uh, should be another critical metric for third-party cyber risk experts yeah, you know, it's interesting you you bring that up because uh, Bob Maley, our CSO, and I did a blog a few months ago talking about concentration risk. And I actually had a call a couple weeks ago with one of my former colleagues about we're seeing like a lot of consolidation in the cloud environment, which is forcing people to deal with more more concentration risk. And, and you actually said something interesting that I think is worthy pulling on a little bit. So you mentioned that the third party targets, there are less of them, but the attackers seem to be going after bigger ones. So they're going after ones that are supporting more companies. Is Are you seeing any differentiation among verticals? Because we know, right, so there are cloud providers that support everybody, but every industry has this their sort of niche, right? So like financial services, for example, they use a lot of the same applications and the same providers and the same is true in healthcare manufacturing. Did you did you have data that sort of aligns with that? Is that what you're seeing as well? Yes, exactly. The, especially the healthcare industry and the finance in industry like the top ones because they share, you know, uh, a, a very common uh, vendor ecosystem, right? Like if you go internationally, you will see the same trend. Like in, in, in some countries, the finance industry use the uh, same SWIFT vendor for the SWIFT operation. So those are very juicy targets for the threat actors because by you know uh, hacking those companies, they can reach out to more victims or obtain data for uh, you know uh, that belongs to more organizations. So, so it's kind of the digital version of the old thing. They years ago they asked Willie Sutton, who was a famous bank robber in the U.S., why he robbed banks, and he said, "Because that's where the money is, right?" So, why exactly. exert effort if you can get more value? Interesting. Okay, um, what are what are some of the top takeaways? Two, three, four things that you think are like really stood out above and beyond the fact that they're going after the, these kind of juicier targets. I love that word, by the way. Um, any other takeaways, any things that kind of went, hmm, like that's interesting or new or hadn't thought about that or that you found surprising? Well, you know, I wouldn't say surprising, but, you know, we see the same type of industry, same type of attack vectors this year as well. Uh, so as, as a former scientist, I would give some numbers, I guess. But, you know, um, Especially the the level of breach impact and destruction of uh, destruction almost do doubled in in 2022. Uh, this year we see that uh, 4.7 affected companies per vendor compared to 2.5 companies in 2021. So even that says a lot about how the threat actors' behavior change on uh, third party attacks. 
And when we look into the, the attack vectors, we see that 40% are classified as the, um, the root cause is classified as the unauthorized network access. And, you know, to be honest, the unauthorized network access is like a better way of saying that, hey, we have no idea how the adversary got into the system, right? Otherwise, they will say that it's like a true phishing or true exploiting a vulnerability and so on and so forth. But usually, uh, the root cause is still unknown. Like for, for 40% of these attacks, um, we still have no idea how they get in. Uh, after all, this forensic investigation and everything. So threat actors trying to uh, erase their, their tracks on the system as well. But we know that it is often true uh, through the exploitation of a critical vulnerabilities that leads to, a, for instance, an unauthenticated remote code execution. And every day, there's a new vulnerability on a common product like Microsoft Exchange Server, and companies are still too slow to patch, probably due to a shortage of staff, shortage of intelligence, and so on and so forth. But the good news is um, we see that nearly half of the attack vendors improved their cyber ratings after the incident. So in, in Turkey, we have a saying that one trouble is better than a thousand pieces of advice. So after the breach, we see like improvement on these vendors, which is some sort of good news, I guess. Yeah. So, so you know, it's interesting you say that. Uh, one of our other guests, uh, my friend Jason Street, who is a pen tester, we were talking a little bit about sort of his success, and he he goes into the same companies year after year, and he says. He feels he's more successful when the second time he goes in and he can't get in because then his customers are learning and, and they're getting better. So so there is some hope on the horizon. You think people are actually doing a better job. I mean, you, met, you mentioned patching, right? Patching is a problem we've been trying to solve as long as I've been around. Yeah, exactly. Um, any, any big surprises? It, it sounds like it's a lot of, I don't want to say more of the same because I think that minimizes it, but any really big surprises, anything that kind of jumped out that made you go like, wow. Well, you know, after, after last year's research, honestly, I was expecting more vendors targeted, but, um, okay. we see that it is not the case. It is more victims, but less vendors. So it was kind of a surprising for me. I wasn't expecting that, but it seems that the threat actors learn how to target wisely. So that was a big surprise. But other than that, I, I didn't see like any, any other surprises. So, so it's, they're moving away from kind of throwing stuff against the wall and hoping to see what sticks to actually thinking about it. So do you, do you think that's a hallmark of the money and the fact that there's organized crime. I mean, you and I have talked about, you know, these ransomware gangs essentially are becoming unicorns, right? They have customer success teams and, and support and sales. So do you, do you think it's because people are getting smarter or maybe are they just getting lazier? Well, <laughs> threat actors are getting more intelligence, I would say. I, I wouldn't classify that as smart or not, but they have enough money to, to obtain more sales intelligence like they're using the sales intelligence tools like zoom in for something like that to understand these all vendor system and structure so they can pinpoint the the most impactful vendor inside the industry ecosystem okay awesome um so what do you see as sort of the short term? So this, this is actually going to be sort of a two-part question. So, so first is, um, what do you think is going to change going forward? So you mentioned that people are getting better. Hopefully that can continue. But coupling that with the fact that I know no one wants to say the R word, but we're certainly at the precipice of an economic adjustment, whatever. You know, we, we talked a lot about that when we did our strategic planning uh, a few months ago, but so what do you see as sort of changing both in the attacker as well as in the in the defender? And do you think economic turmoil is going to have an impact either for good or bad? I mean, one of the things we've seen in the past is that when the economy turns, security professionals who get laid off and don't have jobs, they sometimes move over to the dark side, right? So what, yeah. what do you see as sort of, you know, actually here's what I'm asking, I think a simpler question. What do you think the 2023 report's gonna tell you? Okay, well, yeah, I, I don't want to be the guy who gives 
predictions that will not become a reality. We have enough of those people in here. Well, <laughs> predictions will cut this thing back up and we'll take them out. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I would say that um, I, we will see ransomware because I, I can see that ransomware does not go anywhere in the near future, right? The ransomware groups will target the vendors more and more uh, in 2023. And especially the vendors that uh, store critical data of their client organization. Uh, we see that in the past, like the Black White ransomware group threatened Apple with a schematic of the next generation MacBook that they obtained through a manufacturing vendor in Taiwan. So they didn't even touch Apple at all. So they specifically targeted a vendor, got the information from the vendor without going to the, the, the target organization. And they they make an extortion by using that information. We will going to see those things, uh, I guess, a lot in, in 2023. If we don't, please cut this up. But <laughs> I, that, ransomware will not go anywhere. The other thing is that yeah, I think this less is more strategy will continue where adversaries target the most impactful vendors by obtaining more intelligence on their side. Um, but before, you know, COVID-19, if you ask me about the question about the economy, I would say there will be huge cuts on cybersecurity. However, the remoteness and the increased uh, digital transformation during the pandemic have made it very difficult. So the digital the, the companies are so intertwined and reliant to each other. I don't think there will be huge cuts on cybersecurity, but there will be cuts for sure, uh, because the huge cuts will be equal to that sentence for many organizations and they are smart enough to see that but that will be cuts the cuts will be around like using more automated tools that eliminate the manpower required Lot, large organizations they have luxury to do that but small vendors who have only one it guy may not be able to afford this right so unless the large organization have their vendors improving their cybersecurity posture. We will see more database cut by third party vendors. And, you know, talking about these converting employees, I think, yes, the, another important threat is the insider threat. With a poor economy, it will be easier for threat uh, actors to convert an employee against their own organization. And in, in fact, in this cybercrime business ecosystem, some threat actors threat actor groups make millions, even billions. You know, as we told earlier, they are like evil startups trying to recruit people inside. So I think the insider threat uh, will be another important topic that we will be discussing uh, in the next year. All right. You know what? Maybe we'll have you on in a further episode. We can do a deeper dive. But I, I like that. I like that. That I see a, a good title there for, for a movie, uh, The Evil Insider. I like that. So maybe we'll do that. <laughs> Do a, a joint American Turkish uh, Turkish movie. So, yeah, you know, it's interesting you talk about about cuts. So I've been, you know, in cyber for almost thirty years at this point now, and we've seen the economy go up and down, and we see very similar things, right? IT gets cut, cyber gets cut, but not as much as IT. We see a move toward uh, automation. Uh, and one of the things you and I spoke about the other day is a, a coming presentation we're going to be doing on artificial intelligence, right, as an enabler uh, of, of automation. So for those of you watching out there and listening, definitely, you know, start looking at, at some of those things. We know there's a, just this ridiculous amount of background noise out there, right? And we know not all of it is the same name and people need to focus on that stuff. So great. Um, so, um, what are, you know, people that are going to read this, this amazing report? Um, what are a couple of suggestions you would give to the readers? What should they do? How should they act? Should they change? Should they shift investment in people, process and tools? What would you suggest? You know, if, if I were a CISO, for example, and I read the report, what would you suggest that I do as a result of, of all this work? Well, the, the number one message of this report is probably around the concentration risk, right? Concentration risk is something that organizations should look at collaboratively. They cannot do them by some, they, they need information from other organizations as well. Like for instance, consider the healthcare industry, like right? most healthcare providers share the same vendor ecosystem in a region. 
it's not a secret. Threat actors know that they will go after that common vendors, and they the, because the threat actors also know that the, how valuable the patient information is, right? So we, we the the CIOs and CISOs they should monitor their vendors in terms of cybersecurity posture, understand the likelihood of, likelihood of getting hit by a cyber attack like ransomware, but also understand the value of that vendors from a hacker's perspective which is a quite important metric that they need to look at. Of course, they need first visibility around their vendor ecosystems and the common vendor ecosystems and so on and so forth. But if we can do that, if we can see that uh, common vendors and the concentration risk and so on and so forth, we can better prepare um, attacks like this one that we see in 2022 report. All right. And, and I think healthcare is, a, is an interesting example because for years, when you spoke about cybersecurity and healthcare, the answer was always HIPAA, at least in the US. And one thing we know is HIPAA is not all about security and people are HIPAA compliant and not necessarily very, um, very resilient. And I, and I think that to kind of maybe paraphrase a little bit of what you said, Organizations should be focusing more on managing their risks and identifying where they are. And I think historically, what we've seen a lot of is, well, where, like, where do I get the attestation, the audit? Where do I get to sign off? And and we know that that's not the case anymore. Um, we I had a call with one of our salespeople and a prospect a few weeks ago, and I said to him, "Look, you know, five years ago." You were better off not knowing about something than you were about knowing about it and not fixing it. But that's not true anymore. Not knowing about it is not going to get you out anymore. And the standard of due care keeps going up and keeps sort of pushing more, more requirements. And I think the concentration risk, that to me is going to get worse, even if the defenders do a better job. Because if you have 20 cloud providers that do something now and next year there's only eight you can't really do much about that. Um, what do you see an opportunity maybe for, um, dare I say, additional regulation around the providers hitting a standard of due care? I mean, we see a lot of compliance requirements and, you know, SOC 2s and, and, you know, NIST 800-53 and ISO and all those things. But what do you, no, so actually I'm going to ask a slightly different question. What would you suggest to auditors, regulators, and countries to empower organizations not to be hit by concentration risk? Because in some cases, they don't have any control. Exactly. I mean, that, that's the, the, the biggest issue about the compliance and regulations, right? They, they draw a baseline, but it's just a baseline. Um, being compliant doesn't mean that you are secure because even if you are uh, compliant, it's only you are the compliant. What about your vendors? What about the, the ecosystem and so on and so forth? So all the regulations and these compliance frameworks should enlarge their control items by adding more on the third party visibility. Because it's not like a word like this, hey, I am secure enough. If something happens because of my vendors, I don't care. It's their responsibility. We are not, we are not there. Like, we passed that. We are in a future, we are in we are in a place that all these vendors they become a, a huge ecosystem, digital ecosystem should act together. So we need to help each other. And regulators should also encourage people to share information between each other to um, identify this concentration risk. I love that information sharing is so important and it has been so difficult. Every conference I've been to in the last 10 years, they always talk about public private partnership. Um, but you know, you, you said something interesting, which I talked about with Bob Maley when we spoke, um, everybody knows home Depot and target got hit via third parties. Nobody knows the name of the third party, although Bob did, of course he did. But I think that's the thing, right? If I collect personal data and I give that data to a third party and that third party is breached, people are coming after me, right? The responsibility and the accountability come, comes back to me. 
So uh, the good news is one of the things we're seeing is more and more regulation. So DORA out of the EU has a whole section on third-party risk management. The SEC in the U.S. has been pushing back on, on third parties and asking a lot more questions. Uh, we see the U.S. federal government is looking for uh, application security right through third parties, right through SBOM requirements. And we've talked about that uh, a number of times on some of our, our internal calls. So I think that that'll help a little bit. Um, but I think ultimately the biggest challenge is a lot of these third parties are really small mom and pop companies, right? You know, people talk yeah. about like the, the DOD for any company, any country, you have a bunch of big suppliers that are multi-billion dollar companies, but there are tons of companies that all they do is make one screw or one fitting or one cable. Well, those companies, to your point, they don't have a seat, the chief information security officer. They have an IT person who runs everything. And I think that's going to be an ongoing, uh, ongoing challenge going forward. There, there's only so much you can do. And here's the thing. I always refer to myself as a professional paranoid. But that being said, I can't in good conscience go to anybody and say, you know what? You need to take 90% of your budget and replace this system that works because you can't secure it anymore. Right? Because then you're going out of business. And I think we saw a lot of that with risk appetite shifting, um, especially at the beginning of, of COVID. So, okay, great. Um, so we're getting toward the end of our, our time, uh, and I, we could probably talk for hours, and we probably will at some point in the future. Um, but I think maybe the audience might be interested. What other cool research is, is the team working on other than the next version of, of the third-party risk report? So what, what can our listeners expect to see in the next three, six, nine months from your team? Well, thanks for asking that. Um, well, we are working on a ransomware report right now where we analyzed more than 2,500 ransomware victims uh, in 2022, and we have very interesting results that come out of that research. Uh, from industries to countries, from uh, the annual incomes of these uh, organizations to ransom payments and so on and so forth, we, we look into several aspects of the victim. So it's more like a victim's uh, perspective report and a factual-based report. It's not like a survey-based report. It's a factual-based report that we prepared. And this is one thing. And the other thing is that uh, we also want to do something on the concentration risk. And we are looking at the common vendors for specific industries. And we will have a, a report around that probably mid-year. Uh, and But the ransomware report will be uh, available soon, hopefully next month. Uh, but the concentration risk report will be available uh, mid-year. That that's going to be huge. I would love to help uh, in any way that I can uh, with that. So, all right, awesome, Farhat, a pleasure as always. You know, I'm a big fan. Uh, I, the work you guys are doing is is amazing. Uh, so, a couple things just to kind of retract. So, uh, the proper pronunciation of Farhat's last name is Dikbiak, right? Or clo close enough. Close enough. Close all right. <laughs> All right. Um, for what it's worth, people mispronounce my last name all the time, and it's it seems to me to be pretty easy. Um, so uh, a second thing we learned is that there is a very very prolific movie industry in Turkey. So definitely go check out some of those some of those movies. Um, a third thing we learned is that uh, there are still bandits in Turkey as opposed to thieves and robbers, which is good, interesting. Um, we also learned some things about the report. Um, the attackers are getting more focused, more laser pointers. They're looking for the bigger targets. But that does not mean if you're small, you should ignore these things, right? Because let's face it, low-hanging fruit. People are going to go after uh, you know, the, easiest, uh, the easiest way. They're going to go where, where the money is. And we have a cool report coming out uh, sometime over the next year, another ransomware report, and this report on concentration risk. So Farhat, any, any closing thoughts for our uh, listeners before we go? Well, be safe. That's, that's the biggest wishes that I have. But, you know, thank you, uh, Jeff, for hosting me. It's, it's a pleasure. And I, I, I had so much fun talking to you. Awesome. And I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to be up in the office in a couple of weeks. So we'll, uh, we'll sit down and have uh, some, some coffee. We have to get some Turkish coffee in there. I love Turkish yes. coffee. 
very, very hard to get in the U.S. Though. <laughs> so um, with that, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, I loved you. Be safe because my closing line is always be safe, be healthy, healthy and be secure. So I love I love the, the safe thing. Um, so with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us on today's episode of Risk and Reels with our guest, Farhat, the head of research at Black Kite. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay secure. This has been Jeffrey Wheatman. Have a great day, everyone. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Risk and Reels, a cybersecurity podcast. Be sure to follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to riveting 30-minute conversation about movies and cybersecurity. Jeffrey will be on the road this year at some of the industry's biggest events, but you can always find him on LinkedIn and Twitter at Jeffrey Wheatman. This podcast is powered by Blackkite, the only security rating service to deliver the highest quality intelligence to help organizations make better risk decisions.